Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. The feeling of being watched. It's exciting if you're in front of an audience, willingly performing, sure. But what about the other feeling of being watched? The unwanted kind. Feeling like someone or something unknown is watching you. That doesn't feel exciting. More like terrifying. Especially when you can't see the thing that you know sees you. Where are they? Who are they? What are they? Judging by some of tonight's stories, it seems even if you get answers to those questions, or even if you physically don't see your watcher, you likely will have to face them. So, let's get started, shall we? Around the time that I was about 22 or 23, I was a paid professional stage actor. It was one of the most wonderful gigs I've ever had in my life, with the exception of one experience. The theater building itself was supposedly haunted. I, myself by now, can sort of confirm that it is. Unless, unless what happened to me was something else that I just straight up cannot ever explain for the rest of my days. To give backstory, the theater building I worked at was a library prior around the 1920s through the 30s. However, when a young girl was assaulted and murdered and left in the middle of an aisle upstairs, without anybody noticing or hearing, the library was immediately shut down. It was a thing. A few decades went on, and then, around the 1960s, they turned the old library into a round stage theater with a catwalk up by the ceiling. Even before I was cast in the production, I'd already been aware that the theater was supposedly haunted. Of course I was intrigued, but I knew better than to tempt spirits by taunting them, or making fun of them. That's just bad juju. So I just sort of ignored the stories and the tall tales of the ghost. The stories were all the same, from the other actors who had worked in the theater building. It's a little girl, they'd all say. She doesn't like women they'd all say. She has crushes on certain boys, they'd all say. That was the word on the street and in the building. Okay, okay. Now, while being in this production, I had a fellow cast member who was just a bombshell of a woman. Gorgeous, intelligent, a dancer, everything that makes a woman wonderful. A wonder woman, if you will. She was almost technically a dwarf, she stood at a whopping four foot nine. I don't like using words like tiny or small, but I mean, Jules stands at a whopping four foot nine. She's short, you know? Never underestimate that, though. That girl can still kick your ass. Always be wary of tiny dancers, because they have the strength and discipline. Jules and I still talk to this day as friends. She told me once that she was in the women's dressing room about 20 minutes before curtain. She was sitting down on a chair, combing her hair, looking at herself in the mirror after applying her makeup. And then there was a tug from her long hair that pulled her all the way down from out of her chair onto the floor. To this day, she swears she was the only person in the women's changing room. There was just no explanation for it. No explanation she can come up with. And she's smart and a no-bullshitter. Jules is not a liar, and she does not tolerate fancy stories, so of course everyone, myself included, believed her. It was strange. Kodai was this really handsome man who was almost losing his mind because his props and costumes would just disappear out of thin air and were never anywhere to be found. He'd scream and yell before curtain. I had my bench right here. I had my shoes over there. 
Why are they gone? I promise you, I didn't move them. Yeah, he would say that every night before curtain. There was this kid, I forget his name, but he played the young boy in the show. And always, always he would say, every night during intermission, I'm standing backstage waiting for my cue to walk on stage before the beginning of act two. There's a breathing thrust upon the back of my neck. And every single time I turn my head, there's nothing there. And I'm scared. This poor kid was probably about 12 or 13 at best. And to me, well, I was about 23, and to me, it sounded terrifying. Savannah was my scene partner, and she and I had gone to high school together. The camaraderie was already there, so when she told me that she felt terrified to be alone in the theater, I believed her. She had a part of Act Two where she was required to be on the catwalk to drop a long canvas that was sort of a backdrop visually for a scene. Savannah would get tired, though, and while she would lay there on the catwalk, hoping not to be seen, she'd accidentally start to fall asleep. If she fell asleep, the production would have consequences if the scene change couldn't happen. Every night, she said to me, Every night I fall asleep, and then moments before my cue, I hear a little girl's voice say, Coo, 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 loo, loo, loo. And then I wake up, and I drop the canvas sheet, and I get back downstairs to make sure I get on stage, on time. Every single night this happens. So onward, onto my part of the story, or experience, There was this matinee on a Saturday. After the matinee, we got our dinner break, and the entire cast would go take dinner and converse and enjoy ourselves. We had our 8 o'clock show and another at midnight. I decided to head back to the theater building early so I might pass out on the couch and sleep for a few hours before I had to get back into costume, yada yada. Saying that, it must be made clear that I had the keys to the building and I could open up the theater doors once I approached the theater doors. I was actually trusted enough for that. Perhaps that was a curse within its very own self. Logically, the first task I always presented myself with was to turn on all the lights around the building, which I did this evening. There was a bathroom downstairs, and there was a bathroom upstairs. For an inexplicable reason to me, some thought in my head that I had that I still can't explain to this day. I decided to use the upstairs bathroom, which was located by the costume storage. I had never really used it before, and it does not seem sensical to me. But that was the choice that I had made. I marched up the curling, winding, spiraling stairs built way back, back in the day. I turned on the lights upstairs and proceeded down the hallway and into the bathroom and I turned on the bathroom lights. It felt off to me. The air, the energy, the spirit of it all. It was very strange to me. It was unsettling, unnerving, and awkward. I figured it was due to me being completely alone in the theater building, especially at nighttime. Only then did thoughts enter my mind. It's a little girl they'd all say. She doesn't like women, they'd all say. She has crushes on certain boys, they'd all say. Reasonably, the thoughts put me on edge, and I got super duper nervous, like shivering at a cold chill that was absent from the room. When I had finished with my business, consistently looking back behind me, I opened the bathroom door to find that all of the lights had been shut off. The entirety of the theater was pitch black, with the exception of the bathroom, whereupon I had just turned on the lights. Through that little light protruding from the bathroom, it traced along the hallway, and looking down it, I saw the silhouette of Jules. Ah, I said to myself playfully, 
She turned off the lights and wants to fool around. I had been feeling tired and sort of wanted to take a nap, but no young man in his right mind turns down the opportunity to get in some frisky action, especially with such an attractive lady insisting. I marked where she was standing in the hallway, and as the door closed behind me and the hallway became breached with complete darkness, I'd already calculated where she was standing. Saying, hey you, as I approached where she stood, I put my arms out for an embrace. There was no response, though. There was nothing there. Oh, I see, I said excitedly. You want to play games with me? So I walked further and further down the hallway, putting my hands out in front of me. I realized I had made it to the costume storage. Racks and racks of old clothes and wardrobe and costumes. Aisles and aisles of them. In the complete darkness, I put my hands here and there, feeling my way around, touching the fabrics that hung on their hangers on the racks. Expecting to find jewels, but it ended up just resulting in more searching. Where are you? I asked. Come on, where are you? That's when it started to sink in. That's when it hit me. This feeling of being watched, being witnessed, being warned. There was this insatiable amount of dread percolating through my blood vessels. Immediately, I was very, very uncomfortable and scared. That's when the giggle came. Not a laugh. A soft, silly, child-sounding giggle. (laughs) Who's there? Who's that? I asked. A jacket of some sort, or something, fell off of its hanger and landed on my shoulders, draped around me. I cannot remember if I screamed. I just may have. But I know I ran. Into the dark, into a hundred other clothing racks that shook and fell. It took me some time to readjust where I was and to get my bearings and figure out what part of the room I was in. Finally, finding the spiral stairway, I ended up completely bombing it, completely failing and just falling down the stairs like a rag doll. After a loud moan from feeling like I had just busted my ribs, I found my footing and ran into a few walls before I finally found the front doors. I burst them open so quickly and I just ran. I didn't care if I left them unlocked. Running down into the parking lot, the whole cast and crew were approaching. There was Jules, along with all of them. There was no way that she was ever in the theater. Hey, I shouted at her. Did you just fuck with me? What? She looked at me inquisitively. No, what are you talking about? I thought I saw you in there. I told her, panicking. You turned off all the lights. The stage manager for the show just looked at me, calmly, plain as day. Oh, that's just the ghost. If she turns off the lights, it just means she likes you. The entirety of the production prior had led me to no experiences with said ghost. And nothing ever happened after that, either. So I grow curious from time to time whenever I ponder upon it. What happened? Was it in my head? A trick of the light? And when I grow more curious, I wonder, why then? When so many others were having these strange experiences and I wasn't, why did it happen then, when I was all alone? It's a little girl. She doesn't like women. She has crushes on certain boys. As flattered as I should have been, to this day, I'm still terrified whenever I think about it. I haven't worked for that theater since that production. Help me rationally process something that just occurred. Like I literally hopped into my car 
locked the doors and started typing this. About ten minutes ago, I began this walk to my car. Right now, it's almost 4 a.m. It's a quiet, empty street. I'm making my way down the sidewalk when this woman rushes up behind me and clutches my arm. I'm like, what the fuck? And I try to pull away, but she squeezes my arm to keep me from separating and matches my walking pace. Her hands are freezing, and she's holding on to me like I was a prom date. I'm like, lady, get the fuck off of me. But she grabs me closer and whispers, Please, just walk. Just walk. Just walk. Just walk. She sounded scared. This put me on high alert, and I continued walking with her, while also trying to look around to see if anyone else was out here. I ask if she's being followed, but she doesn't respond. No, she doesn't even look up at me. We do this for about two more blocks, and then she just lets go of me and hits a dead sprint down the road. I'm like, holy shit, what's going on? Then I hear footsteps running behind me. I look over my shoulder, and I see someone's coming up fast. So I spin around, swinging a haymaker, thinking I'm about to get jumped. But nobody's there. I turn back around, and the girls disappeared too. Gone. Nowhere to be found. I'm now alone again, and scared beyond belief. I then proceed to uncontrollably yelp and jump run all the way back to my car. What just happened? My sis and I were on the subject of the guy in my hometown that went on a killing spree. She brought up this story that I told when it happened. About eight years ago, I stayed downtown. Back then, if you remember, Craigslist had a personal section. I never really dabbled in that, but being curious, I eventually did. So I made an ad, nothing spectacular, and waited. Not much went down. Just some scammers and bots, married people, etc. I got this one message from a young woman telling me how I sound interesting and they'd love to get to know me more. We exchanged pics. She exchanged an older pic, but she looked pretty cute in it. Had a bright smile, big blue eyes. She was nice, I just wasn't feeling her like that. She was 18 and I was 24 at the time, but also she was seven months pregnant. We enjoyed conversations for a few days and decided to link up. She didn't stay far from me. She stayed more on the northeast side, just on the edge of downtown. This day, there was a festival going on. I asked if she wanted to go, but she couldn't because her legs were tired and kind of sore. So I agreed to meet her at her place. She stayed in a northern slum. Not ghetto, but slum. The house was big, but also, you could tell off the bat that it was used as an apartment. Wasn't an appealing house, but... There weren't many other appealing ones either. When I told her I'm outside, I see her come on the front porch. She was a small thing, all of five feet tall, white with dark hair. Couldn't be no more than 90, 110 pounds, and that was because of the pregnancy. Her baby bump was very noticeable. She had a small chocolate Labrador puppy with her. They both were happy to see me. When I got close to her, I was surprised. She didn't have the same bright smile I saw in her pics. Her teeth were gray, and her face looked like someone who was on heavy drugs. Her eyes still had light to them, but overall, she looked like a tired human being, and not in the fatigued sense. I gave her a hug, made sure to watch my strength. We went into the place. There wasn't nothing sketchy about it. It stunk, like animals and weed. We went upstairs and I saw a black couple up there. They shut their door and it seemed like they were arguing. All the rooms upstairs seemed small 
and the ceilings were slanted. Her room was fitted pretty nice. She was a smoker. I smelled the ashtray stench. We decided to watch Pineapple Express. This was my first time seeing that movie. She complained about her legs a lot. I saw some swelling on them, so I gave her a leg rub. I used her body lotion. She loved it a lot. Appreciated it big time. We talked, and it was getting late. I wanted to head out downtown to catch the heat of the festivities. She looked like she enjoyed my company a lot, and as we were waving goodbye, for some reason I just said to myself, Man, that chick seems troubled. I thought of burning sage when I got home. Like two days later, she hit me up saying that her ex-boyfriend got kicked out of his place and he needed somewhere to stay. So me and her hanging out couldn't happen again. Which I didn't care. I just told her I understood and to make sure that she's safe. I left for Chicago to spend time with my family. I came back a week later and after getting my hair twisted, I saw a realty sign with her last name on it when I was out for a walk. She had a unique last name. I decided to check on her. I sent her an email. No response. About five minutes later, I opened up Facebook, and as I scrolled, I stopped immediately because I saw the very picture that she sent me. I'm like, why the hell is that pic on here? Well, I clicked a link saying there was a triple homicide. I sat on the curb and was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I read the details and was just shocked. She met a guy on Craigslist for sex. Supposedly, her boyfriend met him too, because he killed the ex-boyfriend and decapitated him. Left his body at a park that I was familiar with. He took her and held her captive in his basement. He tortured her for a week. What made me so pissed was that he went to a sports bar down the street from me and told the bartenders how he had someone locked up in his basement right now. Nobody took it seriously enough to call the police. That probably could have saved her. He strangled her, stuffed her in a suitcase. By then, the police figured him out, and he was on the run. When they stopped his car, he decided to take himself out. And what I mean by that is, he killed himself at the end of a high-speed chase. The cops followed him, and he shot himself. The woman was in the trunk of his car, inside of a suitcase. They found him probably because of the emails from Craigslist. I know they investigated my email. I deleted it immediately once I took all of this in. About a month later, I was on Craigslist, and I saw the miscellaneous section about meeting scammers and such. I posted a reply about people being careful and I posted her story. Also around then, I had a guy that I went to high school with who got caught robbing people for money on there. When I summarized her story, I got a reply from a lady demanding to know what I know. Come to find out it was her aunt. When I told her she wanted to talk on the phone, so I did. I gave her my condolences and told her about the time that we spent together. She told me her ex was pimping her out. Her life was never like that. Her parents were good people and confused that she took that path in life. That girl was just a baby. I've been around death before, but nothing like that. Because what if I kept hanging out with her? The crazier parts are the guy had another woman in his place, but she escaped. She was living with him and he made her his sex slave. But also, he was supposed to fly to Vegas to meet a lady from a fetish site. But there were complications on his end. The day he committed the murder, he contacted the lady and told her he wanted to meet her ASAP. He was paying for the travel and everything, but she needed his info. She didn't go through with it. And she looked him up and happened to see his connection with a triple homicide. What's even more dark is that they didn't find her ex-boyfriend's head at the park. Just his body. They found his head north of the city in 2019, 
like 25 miles away from his dead body. Why did he take the head? What did he do? And why travel with it like that? The awkward thing is that there was a lady who lived with me a year after that. Things were complicated and I had to kick her out. She moved into the exact room that that chick was in. I know because I had to come over to give her some stuff that she left. This is also the girl that played a major part in my sister and her ex-boyfriend breaking up for good. People do come into your life for a reason, I suppose. I used Craigslist for business and some social events. But after that, my approach became entirely different. And I became very cautious on who I met. When I was in kindergarten, my grandpa died. I didn't really understand at the time what was happening, which was good. But what I do understand is that I saw him afterwards. I was at recess, and I remember playing on the little toy, the ones that the kindergartners could play on. I looked over, and I saw my grandpa standing on the other side of the fence. I smiled, and I waved at him, and then I went to run over to the fence, even though we weren't allowed to. I was just about there when my teacher stopped me, asking me what I was doing. I knew I wasn't supposed to be near the fence. But it's my grandpa. He's just right there on the other side of the fence. Can't I say hi to him? My teacher looks over at the fence, back at me, and tells me, Sweetie, there's no one there. But if family comes, they go to the office. Remember? Yeah, I did remember. But my grandpa, he was right there. I looked over, and she was right. He was gone. Later that day, I remember my parents sat me down and had a real talk with me about death. They told me that grandpa passed away that morning. After they finished explaining, I asked my mom, but how did I see grandpa today at school if he died this morning? Neither one of them had a good answer for me. My mom just said, maybe you saw someone that looked like grandpa, sweetie. No, that wasn't it. I definitely saw my grandpa. But even as a five-year-old kid, I didn't really feel the need to plead my case to my parents. Over time, they came around, though. You see, I didn't care that they didn't believe me or thought that I saw somebody else. In my heart, I always knew exactly who I saw, and so that was the story I would tell. And now, years later, they seem to really like this story. They seem to believe me. I guess something over the years has opened their minds. It was around mid-May 2008. There was this apartment that I lived in with my ex-fiance for about a year. I moved in rather quickly with her because when I first met her, she told me that she had so much trouble sleeping alone in her room. And even in a house with three other roommates, still, there was always such a feeling of dread whenever night fell. When I first visited her apartment and her roommates, everything on the surface level was quite happy. Everybody was friendly and jovial and welcoming. It wasn't until it got dark outside that they'd all start to get anxious. Patrick would dodge his eyes about the room as if he was seeing something out of the corner of his eye. Melanie would be looking up at the ceiling as if she'd heard an unfamiliar noise clamoring about upstairs. Eventually, somewhere into the night, Cassidy would say something like, It's here. I never bothered to ask what they were doing or talking about when these things would transpire. 
I figured it was some sort of house joke of which I was not included. Move-in day was when I started to grasp what was going on. My ex and I were fixing to get to bed when she told me, go to the bathroom now before you fall asleep. All right, mom, I joked. Seriously, she said as she opened her bedroom door and peered down the hallway. You do not want to walk down that hallway in the middle of the night. I went to the bathroom and finished my business, and for the first time, I got creeped out. I couldn't quite tell, but it seemed almost as if I just knew there was somebody outside the door. Upon watching the bathroom light streak down the hallway after opening the bathroom door, I saw no trace of a person. I turned off the lights and walked down the hallway towards my ex's bedroom. It was eerie. It felt like I was a strange victim of voyeurism. Your hallway is creepy. I jumped into the bed, clinging my arms around my girlfriend, feigning fear. Protect me, please. Don't joke. She got up and locked the door and gave me the most serious stare and said, You'll see. You'll see. I didn't fall asleep immediately. From what I recall, I sort of drifted in and out of sleep. Regardless, I remember somebody walking back and forth through the hallway and up and down the stairs. It happened to be quite irritating. That morning after, my ex and I went out to get breakfast burritos. In the car, I brought up one of her roommates walking all over the apartment into the early hours of the morning. We don't know what it is, she said, nervously clutching her goose-pimpled shoulders. But it's not one of us, she finished saying. I laughed a bit. What is it, like a ghost or something? Maybe. She dead eye stared at me. Of course, I believed in ghosts to a degree, but I had never really been sure I had ever experienced anything supernatural or paranormal or whatever. I was raised Catholic, though, so it definitely has a presence in my family's beliefs and whatnot. Attempting to fall asleep that night began the same, with abrasive footsteps pacing the hallway and trudging quickly up and down the stairs. It sounded almost like a child bouncing on the floorboards, trying to get as much attention as they possibly could. It was this strange sort of thump, thump, thump. That sand walk from Dune. To me, that's what it sounded like. It was a weird, unrhythmic thumping. What's going on? I asked myself. I squinted at the clock. It was half past two, and the sounds would never cease. I bounced out of bed, put my ear to the door, and just when the stepping was crossing my ex's door, I quickly opened it, hoping to catch whoever it was. But there was nothing. I peered out into the hallway and I saw nobody. Or it seemed like there was nobody. After a few moments, though, I could tell that there was indeed somebody standing at the very end of the hallway by the bathroom. Shadowed and not quite shaped right. It was almost as if they were blurry or as if they had no solid line or definition. It could almost be considered just a black splotch in the corner. Perhaps a trick of the light, the way the moon lights the hallway through the windows or something. I shrugged it off and said to myself, well, that's friggin' weird. After that experience, of course, I just had to jazz up my new roommates and eventually ask the question. So, guys, what's up with that hallway upstairs? It's not as if they looked at me as if I was legitimately insane, but rather they looked at me as if I was insane for asking an insane question that held such an easy answer. Eventually, I'd find that perhaps the answer was crazier than the question. When the shadow man sees you in the hallway, Melanie began to say, clutching onto the couch pillow, he just lingers there by our bathroom. And as soon as you leave your room and go into the hallway, 
He approaches you, Cassidy added with an interruption of, and it gets really cold, and it just feels like death. I found it sort of odd how Melanie referred to the splotch in the hallway as the shadow man, and then referred to the figure as he twice after that. She had given it a gender, an identity, a step away from a personality. After that, Cassidy referred to the figure as it instead of he, so possibly Cassidy was not seeing the same sort of figure as Melanie, or perhaps even me. I thought maybe the apartment complex was haunted due to the prior tenants, but no go. The apartment complex was brand spanking new. My ex-fiance and her roommates were the first people to move into the apartment. They didn't even have neighbors yet. The second conclusion I came to was that perhaps it was built on one of those creepy, old-timey Native American burial grounds of some sort. But no go. I researched the entirety of the city and anything surrounding it within the city, and the land on which the apartment complex sat was basically, well, just land. Maybe a farm at best, way back in the 30s. It certainly wasn't anything in the records prior to 2008 when the apartment complex was constructed. So I was at a loss. A brand new apartment complex built on absolutely nothing, with no historical significance in a historically insignificant town that has no history of being haunted. Listen to me, Cassidy daringly said to me, with a tone of begrudgment and maybe a smidge of judgment. No, just listen to me. Go upstairs and see for yourself. What? Why? I nervously stood up and began pacing about the room, peering out the window and watching the sun go down. You're the new one, my ex said. You have the most resistance to it. That struck me as an odd thing to say, and at first I thought I'd been dealing with a bunch of overzealous children, afraid of boogie people and other things that go bump in the night. I, of course, said something akin to... Okay, fine then, I will. And up I went. Charging up the stairs, as if I had not a care in the world, I ascended up into the darkness. I turned the corner, and I stood upon the entrance of the crickety hallway, leering down into the nighttime hallway. And then, there it was. The black spot in the corner of the hallway, darker than the darkness itself. It had no eyes, no face. Yet still, I experienced the unshakable feeling that it was glaring deep down into my soul. Suddenly, almost with a whoosh, the inky cloak of terror was right before me, and the hallway was cold and dreadful. And with a surge of energy, I felt myself almost knocked to my bottom, as if something pushed me down just by running past me, and or through me. All I could think to do in that instant moment was careen back down the stairs and freak out in the living room. I was now convinced something weird was upstairs. Afterwards, in the safety of my girlfriend's bed, we both decided not to turn the lights off after the door was locked. So, there we lay in bed, holding each other. It wasn't always like this. My ex's goosebumps were emerging from her skin with every new word she broke upon me. I was happier here, she said. That is, it was until Patrick came. Rather innocently, I asked her, what do you mean? So, Patrick moved in, she explained. This black spot showed up. It grew and it grew like a black hole. That night, she told me that everything was wonderful when it was just the three women who'd initially moved into the apartment. But after Melanie started dating Patrick and Patrick moved in, well, that's when all of the aura about the house became ominous. Soon after Patrick arrived... There was at first just a bad feeling over the bedroom where he and Melanie slept. Then, 
as soon as anybody would slip out of their bedroom to use the bathroom, they were met with the black spot in the hallway, with the whoosh, with the cold, and with the dread. What I had not known or noticed about Patrick was that at the time he was an alcoholic, and until my girlfriend mentioned it to me, I never put together how subtly abusive he'd been to Melanie. Apparently, Patrick had had many nights in which he'd wake up around two or three in the morning, drift into the hallway, only to eventually end up cowering in the corner, screaming and yelling, crying. It's coming to get me. It's coming to get me. The longer I lingered, living in the apartment, the more I got to know Patrick. To me, it seemed as if the longer he lived there, the bigger and darker the black spot in the corner would grow. It was as if it grew stronger, better, faster, had more gusto. It was as if Patrick's soul had been feeding it, slowly but surely. Oftentimes, he'd want to take me out drinking to the bar. I like my pints, like any good Irish Catholic boy indoctored into the church, but I prefer to like the company I keep. And Patrick was not a part of a company I wanted to be around. After a while, I got irritated with the way that he would speak to Melanie and the things that he would say to her. It just kind of irked me. It was inappropriate, abusive, and unnecessary. There were a few times where I'd have to bust into his bedroom and pull Melanie away from him for fear that he'd get rash and do something that would make me just want to annihilate him. It's hard to evict people in the state of California if they pay rent, or even if they don't. They have squatter rights. Yeah, it's a real thing, and it's a pain in the neck. Patrick would drink constantly. He'd steal money or he'd steal things that he thought he could get money from. I caught him a few times, and those few times were awkward and sort of antagonizing. I don't like getting aggro on people, but I don't tolerate abuse, manipulation, and thievery. Consistently, he'd always say, It's the black spot, making me do it. Sure, buddy, sure. I'd say something like, Whatever helps you sleep at night, to him. But he didn't sleep. He was starting to scream and jolt around in the hallway every single dark hour. One of the strangest things I remember seeing there was when Patrick was shoving some books and binders into his backpack as he went down the stairs, and Cassidy was right behind him. And then out of nowhere, she just seemed to lift into the air and fly backwards. It was as if somebody just shoved her with all of the might in the world, and this poor girl, probably a twig at best, just went reeling backwards into the wall. It got weird because I could never see the shadow during the day. It was always more invisible as opposed to shadowy during the course of the day. Then it got weirder because her leg just got raised up, all strange-like. It seemed almost as if she was about to be pulled up the stairs, but suddenly she jerked up and made a strange bellowing sound. I realize immediately the wind has been knocked out of her, and she was trying to catch some air. It got to a point where everybody was on edge all the time, and anybody who didn't live at the house never wanted to come and visit anymore. My ex and I went to different schools at the time. I'd finished a week before her. I had nothing better to do than lounge about and walk around in my pajamas and eat ice cream. You know, priorities. One morning I awoke, and the last thing I remembered is my ex kissing me goodbye before she went to her finals. I took my sweet time unwrapping myself from the burrito of my bedding. I stumbled down the stairs and dove into my ice cream. Wearing just my pajama pants, holding an orangesicle ice cream carton, wielding a spoon. About the time I was enjoying the ice cream the most was the time I noticed the strangeness of the house. How quiet it really was. How empty. There was nobody home. The entire month I'd lived there, 
This was the first time I'd ever had the house all to myself. Around the time that I realized how quiet and empty it was, and how I had the whole house to myself, was when I started to question if I actually did have the house all to myself. Thump, thump, thump. Again, of course. Thump, thump, thump. I've never heard voices in my head or anything like that. I understand our imaginations can run wild with us and whatnot. No, this was the sound of somebody walking down the stairs. I stood there with my bowl of melting orangesicle ice cream, staring up at the stairway, feeling a bit of a showdown, some sort of standoff, waiting for the wildebeest around the corner just thumping its way down, and I heard it, but I saw nothing, witnessed nothing. And making my way around the corner down the stairwell, still nothing was seen by me, but what I heard was ever-present. Then, making its way down the very last step before it was downstairs proper, it just stopped. It stopped. Yet I could feel something was glaring at me. A wild wildebeest stampeding me with its eyes only. I was not welcome, that's for sure. I couldn't really move. Definitely I was terrified. Most certainly I was very, very confused. Also, I was curious and perhaps a bit enraptured. There'd been so much fear revolving, revolving, revolving around this thing, and I sort of wondered if perhaps I should be feeling sort of sorry for it. And I did. I felt a sort of remorseful feeling that came over me, and I started to tear up. I use the word revolve because a revolution is when something comes into a full circle, finding its point from whence it started. I use this word because the fear started the same place and way it ended. It just came so full friggin' circle. Elliot Smith said something in Division Day. When you don't know what you're looking at, it makes it much harder to tame. Maybe he said take, but that's the best way I can describe it. Still, to this day, I was... I was just in the presence of something I knew not... And because of the unknowing of it all, I was basically terrified. Suddenly, as if the air was being sucked out of me, this big, banging, thumping sound went screaming like a banshee up the stairwell. And I had to put my hands on my knees in a crouch position and regain my breath before I opened the front door and ran outside to my car, where I then proceeded to go to the Walmart parking lot just to even things out as far as terror goes. I waited until my ex got out of her finals, and then I met her on campus. We went out to dinner that night. We went to stay with her parents for the two weeks after that. And shortly after that, we moved out for good. I'm not sure what was going on there with that situation. Because as far as Patrick goes... I mean, is it possible that this guy would just bring something around with him? Is it likely he awakened something that lay deep down beneath the emptied out land? Something from long, long ago? I often wonder if I'm any different from Patrick. I wonder if I'm capable of carrying around a darkness about me that I could easily unleash into the darkest hallways of unsuspecting soon to be adults, just wanting to get some sleep. I often wonder, what if it wanted me? What if I was the target?
Well, friends, it appears we've reached the end of tonight's episode. But don't miss a brand new one every Friday night. I want to thank those who shared their stories, and a big thanks to all of you for listening. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to The Darkest Hour, and tap the bell so you never miss a thing. Huge shout out to all of my patrons for their unwavering support. Remember, if you want to support The Darkest Hour in other ways, you can join my Patreon too. Patreon.com slash The Darkest Hour. Follow me and keep up with all things Darkest Hour over on my Instagram at The Darkest Hour YT. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, Darkest Hour at gmail.com or on the Darkest Hour subreddit, The Darkest Hour YT. Stay spooky.